Okay. We are live and recording. Uh, sharp at 8.45 a.m. As we were to India time, of course. It depends. Different times, different part of the world. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever part of the world you are in, whether you see this now or you see this as a recording. Uh, I welcome both the panelists over here. We have Myra Andrea from Jakarta in Indonesia. We have Karthik Sharma, who is from Delhi in India. And you have me, yours truly, Professor Aditya Singh from Bombay in India. And uh, welcome to this panel discussion as part of the Horasis Asia meeting 2021. I am assuming this time has really been flying right for the past couple of years. It's, it was 2019, 2020, 2021. And in a month's time, we'll be 2022. And perhaps in this context, in a world which has been so affected, so changed, by this entire pandemic with lockdown, social distancing, mobility issues, uh, every single sector has been affected positively and negatively. As part of today's panel, we're going to be discussing on developing a diverse higher education sector. And what we've done for you is we made sure that the panelists come from very different backgrounds. The worst thing you want is a panel of academicians discussing how to make academics better. Trust you me, I'm one of them, so I know how that goes. It doesn't go too well for anyone else who's watching. The idea over here is to get different insights, different inputs, and see how perhaps we can make a positive change on the entire higher education sector. And one of the key drivers in this, of course, has been what we call rankings. Uh, if you go back 20 odd years, rankings were not a major driver of in the education sector. Nobody looked at rankings. They looked at word of mouth. They looked at publicity. But in the past uh, you know, few years, you see rankings have become very, very important, be it the Financial Times ranking, be it the QS rankings, and so forth. So what we're debating today is how do they affect quality? How do they affect perception? And very importantly, are they a good barometer? Are they good benchmarks for you to judge? And how does this tie in aid to other industries and other economies, number one? And number two, how does this tie in to the world pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. With those words, I will request the panelists to obviously introduce themselves, very, very important. And then obviously, as the chair, I'll, I'll take that benefit right at the end. So can I request Karthik to start this entire panel discussion forward by introducing himself and his opening remarks. Thanks, Dr. Saritya, and uh, for having me. And uh, greetings to my fellow panelists, Myra, and uh, everyone who's watching here. Um, my name is Karthik, and I run an organization called Decode AI, and we are uh, a business of making people learn AI and be future-proof, because uh, as you can imagine, some of these emerging technologies like AI, IoT, are now impacting all walks of life, and um, we firmly believe that, and it's closely related to the higher education debate as well, that people have to be more relevant once they graduate from their higher education institutions irrespective of, of the ranking, irrespective of whatever uh, line of study they choose in, they ultimately need to be contributing to the economy um, in the country they live in. And that's where we believe that some of these technologies are extremely relevant. To Professor Aditya's uh, point, you know, my, my thought process is that, you know, rankings for sure have been a, a common barometer to for university election. But I think if we take this debate a, a notch up in terms of you know, why would somebody need to even, um, you know, assert on the quality of, of an institution and why use a metric? I was reading a, a, a research paper, I think, a couple of months back, and it mentioned that almost 2.5% is the unemployment rate uh, for college graduates uh, in most parts of, of U.S., right? And, and some of these gaps which happen um, in the college opportunity leads to also a diminished social mobility. So social mobility is, uh, you know, when people move from one strata of the uh, economic engine of the society to another. Now, uh, what happens at school level mostly, uh, because I've also worked at, at school level. At school level, it's a common leveler because everybody around the world, if you see, uh, most of the countries have solved the problem of a higher gross enrollment ratio. So everybody sort of gets through school. The highest dropout ratio is at the entry point of uh, higher ed even in India, if I talk about. And that's because uh, people directly link school education, everybody uh, does because, you know, uh, either through peer pressure, parental pressure, or you just want your kid to study something. 
but at college level the expectation are directly tied into an economic opportunity and there is a very clear one to one mapping and that's where even uh, you know some of these rankings uh, start to play a reverse uh, impact because for example i come from the background of ai many of these rankings are are, are based on sophisticated attributes of of data and we all know that um, if you torture data enough uh, it will always give in right so you can always manipulate data points you can always uh, create higher or lower tolerance level to have rankings uh, manipulated so i think there's a lot of bias which gets uh, inherited into some of these ranking even uh, a lot of people have started to use ai driven algorithms to not have humans uh, do these rankings or be involved in the algorithmic modeling but still there is a higher possibility of bias the other point uh, you know i wanted to also talk about is that you know internationalization of uh, <clears throat> you know edu- higher education professor that talked about and i think i would uh, for myself try to imagine a world and a lot of companies are working in this direction wherein you can have a cross equivalency between various universities so imagine um, you could study design at stanford for a trimester and then study law at harvard or or study uh, you know thermodynamics at, at iit bombay so that sort of a virtual student pass if you could have and then you could use it for uh, studying different courses across different universities around the world albeit in a virtual environment through a virtual student pass i think that sort of a idea of inter- internationalization is something which i believe we are heading towards as well obviously there are certain regulatory norms and a commercial interest to be taken care of in this cross collaboration and also not to mention the various uh, academic standards and bodies to make sure that the uh, the study parameters are equivalent but i think once that is solved it will become a really interesting concept where you could be actually part of multiple universities and get exposure to diverse environments and the other point which i would also like to uh, highlight is that once we are doing this internationalization we should also have or we could also imagine a, a thought process where we'll have more and more cross discipline studies i know for a fact that iits and some of the ivy league institutions have created hybrid programs where you can let's say study design along with uh, behavioral psychology and understanding or you could study stem with with more focus on ui ux so that sort of a hybrid curriculum is being provided which makes it more uh, inclusive and also make sure that the graduates are having a broader exposure to the entire spectrum of uh, product or service development rather than have, having a linear understanding of their own course so i think these are some of the interesting ideas around um, you know how we could have universities become more international and how the entire experience could be more comprehensive and hybrid um would love to talk about it uh, in in the due course of discussion but these are some of my opening remarks uh, professor adit thank you thank you kartik very very uh, profound thoughts and i think you've given us enough fuel to fuel this discussion for some time to go ahead thank you so much and we now move on to uh, sunny jakarta i'm assuming or how is it in jakarta today morning mara all yours Mara, you need to unmute yourself. On the lower side, you will see it next to the uh, mic. You will see mute or unmute. You are muted right now. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Can you hear me clear? Okay. Uh, thank you, Aditya. Hi, um, Katika, and hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm honored to speak again in Horace's event. inside of this issue to address may i share opinion in facing a tech advantage and international to drive innovation with higher education is important at this present with increasingly technology to teach and inspiringly as entrepreneur how to do reflecting on the success of developed the countries such as america and europe almost all university insert entrepreneurship material in almost every course a country such as uh, japan uh, singapore and malaysia also apply entrepreneurship material at least two semester 
this that is delivered to make our neighboring countries uh, developed countries and take a long leap in improving their country development uh, higher education institution as one of the leading mediators and facilitators on um, building the nation young generation have an obligation to teach um, to train educate guidance and motivate their student to become a smart generation that uh, is independent, creative, innovative, able to create a various job opportunity. opportunity. I share about the, this uh, um, to be born to uh, entrepreneurs because my background is about um, uh, help for the uh, business, uh, especially for um, uh, young entrepreneurs and uh, uh, for this reason it must for every university um, in my side um, immediately to have a change uh, the direction it's uh, a higher education policy from a high learning university and research university to an entrepreneur university with the paradigm a change that will give born uh, successful young entrepreneurs. Education policy can be formally understood as the action uh, taken by a government address the production and delivery of education a given system. Uh, also, we example in Indonesia, also we increasingly, increasingly a higher education certification for young entrepreneurs with the only online system. Uh, that is my insight, so I I happy to be um, share and discuss this issue also. Thank you from my side, Aditya. Myra, introduce yourself. You didn't introduce yourself. We don't know anything about you. So that's ah, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Myra. I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, uh, I, I'm a chair of uh, President Indonesia Jordan Business Council, and I'm also have a, a company for consultant. Uh, for investment uh, business uh, in Indonesia or also, and also another country like uh, Middle East, Jordan, and USA. Thank you, Aditya. Thanks, Myra. Myra, I'm going to just keep you on mute. So whenever you speak, just unmute yourself because there's some background disturbance. So I'll yeah. mute you, don't worry. All right. Okay. And okay. Perfect. Great. All right. So with that lead, I think I can also introduce myself. I'm going to take a minute or so. So just be brave. So my name is Professor Aditya Singh. Uh, you know, I am the director of the Athena School of Management, which is a very exclusive business school based out of Bombay in India. Uh, I also am a, a faculty. I teach. I'm a professor for impact leadership and differential thinking. I have a good fortune, of course, of teaching digital transformation, entrepreneurship, innovation, governance, and impact and innovation, of course, across the world, be it FDC in Brazil, be it the Athens University of course, in, in Athens in Greece, uh, in Poland, uh, even in Bolivia for that matter, Turkey and so forth. And it's wonderful because the insights which you get from a global perspective are phenomenal. I am lucky enough to have been a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, the Royal Asiatic Society and the Royal Anthropological Institute all in the UK. I sit on the advisory board for the ESG Research and Innovation Center based on the University of Chicago in, in, in the US. And I sit on several advisory boards. Excuse me, across the world for technology companies, for incubators, and for nonprofits, which focus on innovation and impact. But what I really excite, I'm really excited about doing is sharing ideas, and that's something which, which I'm passionate about because it's ideas which make the world go around. I mean, and, and it's wonderful to see such phenomenal ideas come out. The first thing which I which I take out from, from, from Myra's conversation, of course, is that focus on becoming an entrepreneurial university rather than just a research university. And that perhaps is one of the biggest question marks a lot of people have on international rankings. To give an example, The Economist, which is one of the world's most uh, you know, respected publications, came out with rankings for business schools and universities a few months back. And it was widely panned. People said it had no real reality in the real world. Why? Because it did not include some of the top top schools of the world. So there were no Harvards, there were no Whartons, there were no Kelloggs and so forth. But then the second question is, that is the problem with ranking, right? In many ways, the way you've put the parameters, the way you've put the, the points of judgment, when you look at a school's age, an Oxford or a Cambridge or a Harvard 
or, or a Sorbonne are always going to outrank a brand new education institution because they've been around for hundreds and thousands of years. Literally, I mean, if you see Oxford, it's more than a thousand years. So the University of Paris, how do you compare that? You compare that with, 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 with if you compare that with the amount of research papers coming out, with the amount of citations, the amount of prizes. Again, of course, the older established universities always have a bigger lead because of legacy. You compare endowment. I mean, for example, Harvard has billions and billions of dollars in endowment, which a new university will never be able to match. It's as simple as that. So the question which comes to mind is, are the rankings in the current format the correct way to judge quality and innovation in the university? And that is up for doubt because there are so many intangibles, right? There are so many things you cannot see in a ranking. How are you preparing a student to prepare for the real world? What happens for universities, for example, in the developing countries like Indonesia, like India, like Bangladesh, where remember a lot of students who come to you don't come from a very, very affluent background. They may be for all purposes, the first people in their families or in generations to have gone to university. So how do you compare where they come out in the entire ecosystem as compared to someone who comes from a very well researched family in Europe or in, in, in the US? These are the questions which are always up for tops. So the question is not if rankings are great. I think they are a good way to judge. But the problem is they focus too much on tangibles. And it's become a case of the tail wagging the dog. Rather than rankings helping institutions understand and benchmark themselves where they are, it's become now a question. And we had a lot of scandals in the past few years where universities, where higher education institutions are running after the rankings. So you forget everything else. You just want to have a great ranking because obviously the philosophy is if you have a great ranking, you have a good publicity, more students apply to you, you have motions coming in, so on and so forth. And this puts up to debate. And I'll take one thing which Karthik just spoke about. In this new world, we have such new skills coming out, AI, machine learning, for example, technology. Where does this entire ranking parameter come into place? I don't see too many rankings taking innovation, entrepreneurship, AI, uh, machine learning, all of this blockchain technology learning into the consideration. So how are you actually taking into consideration of future readiness is very, very important. On that point, let's move to the next part. Our governments in Asia and by governments, I also, of course, mean higher education institutions, regulatory bodies and the institutions themselves truly embracing internationalization. And do they know what it means? Karthik, love to have your inputs. Sure. Uh, I'll also touch upon the first part, which you sort of concluded. So I think um, I was doing a project uh, some years ago with, with Gabitas. You may be aware of uh, other things in UK. So the idea was that uh, when you are doing the consulting or advisory for higher education, for even um, HNIs and, and families of a certain cater, so the motivations are very different, especially uh, like if you talk about India, and my right will be interesting for you also to know is that the core benchmark is not ranking as such. It's the highest placement package. So after the after you graduated, on campus companies come, and whoever gets the highest package uh, is a much uh, notoriously advertised number. So everywhere on hoardings, if you go in India, you will see ABC College highest placement package is hundred thousand dollars. So people read that and they take admission. They don't care about the ranking. But if you go to certain other parts of the world. You know, people uh, go by the alumni uh, clubs of the uh, institution. For example, they would not care the ranking the high or low. But if they see that in their line of work or study, the alumni is very strong, then they uh, cater to that. In US, obviously, we know Ivy League, the, the, it's, it's a social status sort of a thing. I couldn't get in my Harvard, so my kid needs to get into Harvard sort of only. So I think the motivations are very different for different demographics. So I think uh, beyond the point, these rankings do not actually also mean uh, a lot to everybody globally. It means different things to different people. For example, I know a lot of people in India don't even see all these rankings, right? And India, uh, what, 20% of the world, right? So you can imagine that these rankings have limited uh, relevance to a large population of the world. Second, I think, uh, tying in with some of these emerging technologies, I feel the future is uh, where people will not see the rankings as such but they would want to know what's right for me. So it's a fitment issue. So let's say, if, uh, you know, I have a background where, let's say, hypothetically, I'm very strong in mathematics. I want to study computational uh, 
thinking as a department along with behavioral psychology so that i can create intelligent um, ai automation systems which are also aware of uh, which are cognitive aware right if that's my intention and aim in life then i'll get a university or a set of universities where i can study uh, as a hybrid program which is good for me so i will not be aiming for a certain higher education institution on the basis of any just global benchmark or a ranking but i'll figure out a combination of courses and universities which works best for me and i think that's very difficult to do as humans because it's just too much of permutation and combination and that's why even if you see in in uh, assessments globally people focus on mcqs and objective types not because they are a good determinant but because they are easy to assess so uh sorry saying that in front of a teacher but because of the convenience of the administration and teachers there is a system created uh, which uh, is used worldwide which is purely based on objective assessment because subjective assessments take a lot of time but that's changing fast because using technology like machine learning you can also do subjective assessments pretty quickly in an automated manner and that's why you will see a lot of focus in assessment especially in ib board and other boards if you look at even at k to 12 people are focusing more on intangibles as professor that they were talking about anecdotal evidences so if you talk about that in the context of ranking people wanting to know how how the alumni are doing seeing videos of an actual lecture uh, being done in a class so all these intangibles packaged properly and using machine learning it can be curated for you as an individual so i think that sort of an experience curation is something which is possible uh, through these technologies coming to the second point quickly uh, from a regulatory perspective i think most countries uh, it, it's a very complicated uh, and and i think you are much qualified than than me to talk about it it's a very uh, sensitive matter right i mean people want international universities to sort of partner with local universities set up campuses contribute to local economy but they still want uh, their uh, domestic universities to do well and i think there is a big focus on now especially uh, you know i was talking to iit director uh, two weeks back iits are now setting up international campuses which is an unprecedented move uh, nobody thought about it right so i think that there is a focus of uh, universities and higher education institutions setting up cross country campuses but i think uh, Uh, from a regulatory perspective there has to be greater exchange because i i, I know for a fact that in india because a lot of students have aspirational um, ambitions to to go to study in in certain universities like ivy league there was a higher demand and that's why you know there were some diluted norms around them setting up uh, virtual campuses and also some physical centers but i think as uh, uh, pro, pre uh, pre covid that was the situation but i think post covid Uh, with Indian universities also coming up to the ranks and setting up their campuses, I think unless we have this equivalency sorted out, because uh, that's a big problem. If you started a certain course or a program in one country as per their curriculum, then how is that uh, treated in your host country or in a, any other country? So I think unless that is sorted, and I know AIU, we've got an institution called AIU in India, Association of Indian Universities, which also does a bit of advocacy around it. but i think it's a pretty complicated matter and there is a conflict of interest in conflict of interest even from government's perspective to promote their own um, institutions thanks so much uh, karthik and and thanks for the for the deep insights really respect that and and find that so mara i'm going to put a bit with you i'm not going to go into the deep side of academics all right as this as, as i promised you i'm going to ask you something else in you since you've been part of this entire internationalization effort from an economy perspective creating bonds between the middle east and jordan and southeast asia which by nature are not very close to each other as it is what are the challenges you've seen when it comes to the cultural part of two different countries trying to come together create bonds when it comes to internationalization trade etc and where do you see the challenge a in high education so are you seeing joint ventures happening between the middle east and southeast asia number one in higher education and what could perhaps make that happen in the future also if it's not happening right now thank you aditya is um, well, this is a great um, question is uh, uh, what uh, we are doing the challenges right now for indonesia uh, example 
uh, I don't mention another country, but uh, the example Indonesia and Jordan. Uh, we are uh, starting for a trade with, uh, in education um, uh, deliver program for uh, Indonesia student to Jordan to uh, exchange like uh, ICT program technology and a startup educate and also uh, we deliver the student to be um, a full skill certification this is not uh, should be from the high grade university or high very education but we, uh, we can help for the teach them from Indonesia and exchange uh, 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 help a student to Jordan and they start um, uh, study in the uh, some of university example university of uh, uh, on Jordan um, then they will have uh, ex, uh, certification from there uh, that's what we are doing right now that's very challenging because Indonesia and Jordan also mostly have the same culture and then also uh, because we are brother and sister not only for muslim we have another religions also and uh in jordan and as we we're facing right now the global digitalization this i'm sorry digitalization for the technology a startup is uh, going up for young entrepreneur who they willing to start uh, uh learning for to be entrepreneur or another uh, sectors, not in the business. Uh, also, we can help like teach them in the healthcare and the um, uh, another another um, uh, sectors like um, yeah, hospitalization, uh, tourism, uh, like that. That's uh, what we are doing. We teach uh, a student here. We um, uh, give them like some platform program to help them to help the student and we're starting to make cooperation join venture join join um like uh, between university indonesia and jordan and also uh, another in uh because indonesia also mostly uh many muslim so we can also invite from jordan to teach our Indonesia needs. It's like a Muslim uh, teaching for uh, religions and also another. That's that depend on the program what we we are confirmed between two countries. Thank you, Aditya. Thanks, Myra. Thanks, thanks again for for the unique insights. You know, and and that's what that's what I love about Horace's panels. People come with such fantastic insights and different insights. Um, on my for my two pens, I think internationalization in higher education is critical for it to succeed for two reasons. A, if you see from a population base, the population, especially in Europe, is not growing anywhere soon. So they're running out of students. It's as simple as that. You need students to take it forward. And B, of course. From a developing world perspective, being an Asia perspective, uh, this is where the population is growing. We have the world's highest population when it comes to below 25 years old. And they want opportunities. They want chances. They want, it's not good enough now to just be normal or be good in your own country. You want to be good on a global level. It's wonderful. Uh, you know, Karthik will, will relate in, you know, in India, we are producing a unicorn every single week i mean he's losing count for god's sake and when i mean a unicorn i mean a company which is a startup which is valued at a billion dollars we've just had a unicorn a couple of uh, weeks a week back which just started seven months back and they're already a unicorn now this is inspirational and it's wonderful for young people to see that if they work hard they can succeed internationalization is critical for that to happen because without the free flow of ideas without the free flow of knowledge nothing can move forward and of course, we are seeing global universities, global business schools, global engineering colleges come and try to set up campuses in India, in Southeast Asia, and so forth. But I think what that is not a relationship of equals. What we're going to see, as Karthik was propounding, is this mobility which needs to happen between institutions where there is a tangible quality put that, okay, you put six months or a trimester over here, you move over here. And that's something which we're seeing happening. You know, people talk about COVID in bad terms and COVID is horrible, no doubt about it. The one thing which we've seen happen from personal experience is what we call COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning. 
And you are seeing this happening in a phenomenal way. So today, a, a student sitting in Jakarta or Amman or, or New Delhi or Bombay is doing a joint project with a student sitting out of Amsterdam or New York or, or Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. I mean, in the comfort of their own living room. So yes, technology along with mindset are great enablers for institutions and education to move forward. But that brings me to the next part, which is, you know, we talk about rankings, we talk about higher education. You know, we really like to understand from a cultural perspective, how important is higher ed in, in, in Asia? And do you think it is going to still keep the trajectory of growth? Or do you think there's going to be some challenges that it faces in the next decade or so? Karthik, let's start with you. So I uh, personally believe that it will uh, go through a massive transformation and we're already beginning to see it. For example, you know, almost a decade back, uh, there was a huge rush for people wanting to do uh, engineering courses and management courses in India. And now almost 45 to 50 percent of them are lying vacant. AICT is closing them down. So uh, I think there's a massive redistribution of uh, skill sets which people want to pursue. And at the same time, I think people have also realized that uh, there are certain skill sets for which universities are not even ready. So if you want to be a, uh, you know, a social media strategist and, and these kind of em or emerging technologies like AI, IoT, there are only a handful of universities uh, who are decent enough where you, where you can learn, where professors are also, uh, you know, well qualified to help you learn those courses. If somebody wants to learn, you know, um, blockchain or distributed ledger technology. There are hardly universities around the world which can give you a amazing course on it. So the relevance of, of universities are also under the question because they have already always uh, traditionally relied upon industry to give them inputs. And now industry anyways is, uh, you know, looking sideways because they are also not sure how things are evolving. Like I work in the area of AI. Every day we get new um, AI learning models and algorithms. It's hard to keep pace. Uh, even as industry. So who has the time to spend time with, with academia to, to guide them? And I think the biggest competitor of higher education institutions now are uh, companies who are setting up their own learning academies and learning centers because they know that they can run, especially some of the larger ones, they know that they can set up a process in which people can learn their specific learning parameters, their processes, be aligned to their job descriptions, uh, their IP, uh, their culture. And uh, that's worked well for some of the largest MNCs, like in the largest tech companies like Infosys, uh, Wipro, Etsy, and uh, so on and so forth. They have massive learning campuses. And uh, they openly say that anybody from any stream come in and in six months after going through our program, you'll be relevant for us and you'll be relevant for any IT company. So that's a bold statement. And we have seen it work over the last 15. I've seen it work over the last 15 years. So I can tell you confidently that it works, right? Uh, so they have beaten... In, in some way, that sort of a traditional university system where the companies have taken ownership of the D&D processes from initial skill building to the employability. So I think unless uh, higher educational institutions really figure out a way to excite industry, to invest time in them, uh, I think it's going to be uh, extremely tricky. But for traditional courses, no problem. I mean, if somebody wants to be a chartered accountant or study law, uh, pretty much it's going to be the, the same format. People would want to go to a university or an institution. But if you are in, in sort of a cutting edge space, if you want to learn something new, I think it's very, very um, hard for universities to keep students excited and engaged. And we have seen it in COVID, right? Like in K-12, I watched in front of my eyes, like parents now are okay. Uh, I mean, in India, it's a big thing, right? People have to send their kids to school every morning. They go to work. And in two years now, uh, many parents have are now not opting to send their students to school. They are okay with their kids being at home, studying on and off, doing a little bit of homeschooling, spending time learning through online programs and courses. And that's a big uh, paradigm shift, especially uh, if we talk about Asian culture, where people have to wake up in the morning. There is a regimented approach and you go to school, come back to your homework, that sort of a deal which has completely changed now. And people are questioning the relevance of whether I really need to send my uh, child to an educational institution or he or she can learn at home and on an off basis I can send. 
so i think the way i see it is that universities will become more like a melting point of pot of ideas like such learning clubs so it's like a gym right i mean you go uh, you go to a lab you get diagnostic and they say oh you know your heart is not uh, strong go to gym and do cardio similarly the education ecosystem will also evolve you will have learning diagnostics being done on you and you figure out this is what you need to learn this is how you need to learn and then universities are those sort of gym where you go but then you also work on your diet get peer advice be part of a community but that sort of a social learning club would be the future uh, vision of university the way i see it but people would want to take more and more learning in their own hands and the biggest threat would be companies and industry directly uh, working on their own to manage this rather than investing time in educating the universities to come up, up to speed thanks karthik a lot of insight into that and and yes the problem is or you know the concern is corporate universities so be it colgate university in the us emphasis campuses over there of course the other side of the fence is when they're training people up for their companies they're buying them to a lot of skills which are unique to their companies right and the challenge comes when these guys leave and go to other sectors and other companies then they have a natural wall but then i think that's an internal unsaid hr uh, play which is all right all fair in love and war as they say so that's perfectly all right all right myra i'm going to ask you a question now uh what or rather how would you like to see universities higher educations change and become more relevant to the real world based out of where you are both in indonesia and in jordan i mean where they, i mean how do you want them to be more relevant how do you want them to be more more relatable in your opinion in my opinion it's depend on what is the person uh they have a goal i think i agree with kartika also all 100% but back to the person who uh, the student uh what they process to become let's say what you will achieve you have more higher rank uh higher education more upgrading uh, to be um the others uh program to what kind of industry you will take for process to do that you have to be learning something more than important for that so we ha- we are we have to understand what kind of the goal what we will make this is my opinion thank you aditya thanks myra uh and i'm now going to move towards more of the closing statements because obviously oh time flies we just have 6 or 7 minutes left and of course i'm warning you i'm going to keep 2 minutes for my grand speech at the end so just remember that so but before that um and 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 karthik you've covered a bit of this before but i'm going to ask you again uh what is your vision what is it that you would like to see higher education and how do you think it's going to evolve from an asia perspective but also from a global perspective in the next decade how do you see it changing how do you see it really impacting lives rather than just being degree factories where you just go to get a degree and say i got a qualification right no so i think uh, i'll broadly cover it in three parts and i think i've already touched part of it so one i think um, universities and higher educations uh, need to figure out uh, and map out the skills which are going to be extremely relevant not even now but in next 4 to 5 years because remember by the time you graduate and you pass out uh, the world is a different place right uh, so you need to have universities who can deliver future proof courses and who are not just catching up with what's the latest fad or latest trend so i think that bit of visioning needs to happen at the university level which can obviously happen in close uh, collaboration with the industry and and the uh, ecosystem of startups especially because uh, startups are the ones who are working mostly on these uh, future proof uh, areas of work in technology so i think more collaboration with startup ecosystem uh is one second i think uh, university is working closely with other universities that's something which we haven't seen happening um, on an execution level i have seen in my personal uh, capacity a lot of mous being signed a lot of sister universities concepting set up signing ceremonies photo ops and what not but nothing really happens beyond that so i think really having a uh, cross consolidation of curriculum mapping it on, on a course level and skill level and credit equivalency being set up is the second part third i think is uh, involving a uh, regulatory bandwagon in in these cross collaborations wherein universities 
and higher education institutions are also able to have a legitimate route through the regulatory bodies wherein they can create that sort of an ecosystem which i talked about where a student could have a virtual pass and study multiple courses in different university through a virtual pass that sort of uh, accreditation being given to such a uh, virtual learning pass sort of a concept is is i think crucial uh, for somebody to learn the best because we know that not every university is good in all departments it's a known fact university themselves say that okay our this department is the best so i think getting the best from uh, each of the university or higher education institution is something which is extremely pertinent and lastly i think you know to be able to create a curated experience and i know a lot of, a lot of startups are working on it wherein uh, the whole discovery process of what to learn so i think knowing what to learn is the hardest question now in the world uh, i think solving that uh, through a curated experience saying that okay these are the possible uh, you know future technologies or future areas of study and and this could even be for regular stuff right let's say if you are studying accountancy or or trying to become a chartered accountant now we know that the role of ca 20 years or cpa in us 20 years back was very different i mean they used to define how uh, you know you have to work on your financial statements how to dress your books and what not now everything is done through softwares and there are data entry people who are doing it and then all the visualization uh, bi and and data science works on it and you get everything set up so the role of cpa is just pure governance and monitoring they don't need to do anything hands on so i think trying to figure out and telling people that your role or your line of study is going to evolve like this and then mapping it to your skill set and your ambition and aspiration as myra said so i think there's three way mapping if somebody can do and then curate okay this is the best learning basket for you and then through a learning virtual pass do these learning over the next two years three years so it's not also set that you have to learn for three years or four years you can pace it out you can take a maternity or paternity break in between so that sort of a flexible learning process uh wherein you pick what you want to learn how you want to learn where you want to learn at what time you want to learn i think that's the future uh, the way i see professor thanks uh, karthik so looking at a lot of customized technology driven education uh, which depends more on what the user wants rather than what the producer wants to give or so can, so the, the as they always say the customer is always king so we're going to see that happening in this industry myra any final words to round this off yes i'm sorry hello <laughs> myra yes. final words to, to round this up what is i mean you know in a minute i'd like to just conclude what you what you feel about where this is going and what is the future of higher education a uh, higher education of course uh, we will expecting that um we'll have for the achievement is about the um of various um job opportunity that it's so simple for me that's fine this said the the main of achievement that's <laughs> wonderful and and it's it's, it's you know <laughs> sometimes <laughs> <laughs> simple the simplest things are the most hard hitting and i can't believe it it is proud right in the end people people are doing this to get good careers and good jobs and that's very very important on yes. that note i'll 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 end this by by sharing the concluding note which is as simple as this uh we started with rankings and we evolved into some quite different we moved into the future of higher education and that perhaps is a manifestation of how this world is moving you may start in a certain direction but you quite don't know where you end up what well, that means is that as an economy as a society and as people we have to be flexible we have to be agile we have to be ready to innovate we have to be ready to introspect and ready to take opportunities as they come the old world is gone long live the old world the new world has risen or is rising from it and it's up to us as practitioners academicians industry and policy makers how we take this forward and the one thing is very clear is relevant knowledge is important the time for bookish knowledge is great as a foundation but you need to help people learn what is going to be re really skill sets for them for the future and you need to help people build their creativity in the end that is what's going to help us evolve as a society and evolve as a people on that note i would like to thank both my panelists wonderful inputs and oh we just got a message in the time as a lap so bang on time thank you for all of you attending over here it's it's been, it's been a wonderful experience and i wish all of you 
fair winds and fair sailing as you move forward. Stay safe, stay healthy. Until the next time. Take Thank care. you, Aditya. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Mara. Bye, Karthik. Bye, everyone.